this week has been a rough week. I lost my MacBook Pro. I didn't lose it, but I spilled grape juice on it, and the grape juice went down between the keys and got underneath, and after a few days, it stopped working, and the damage was already too expensive to repair at that point. I somehow feel like it would have done better if I'd spilled apple juice on it. Have you ever had a friend that said, I'm behind you, man. Uh, let's, I'm all in with you. Uh, I want to support you. I want to help you. And I will do this and I will do this for you. And then after a little bit of time went on, they either forgot or they got mad at you for something, even if you didn't know what they were mad at you about and they quit and they backed off and went and just they abandoned you. And then you've got trust issues. Well, I don't know if I trust him now because he said he would help me and then he didn't or whatever. You know, what we're going to see here today is that the Lord God has made a covenant with David and he says, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to make this happen. And so when the Lord says he's going to do something, he does it and he's going to stick with it. Uh, whatever he says he's going to do, he sticks to it. Now, David's gone through a mess. There's some problems he's got to deal with. But that doesn't change the fact that the Lord God said, I will do this covenant, and that was despite David, okay? So that's one thing you can take comfort in with the Lord God is when he says he's going to do something, he does it. So let's go on and look here in 2 Samuel 19 and 1. And Joab was told, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard it said that day, The king is grieved for his son. And the people stole back into the city that day as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. But the king covered his face, and the king cried out with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab came into the house to the king and said, Today you have disgraced all your servants who today have saved your life, the lives of your sons and daughters the lives of your wives, and the lives of your concubines, and that you love your enemies and hate your friends. For you have declared today that you regard neither princes nor servants. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all of us had died today, then it would have pleased you well. Now therefore arise, go out, and speak comfort to your servants. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, not one will stay with you this night. And that will be worse for you than all the evil that has befallen you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and sat in the gate, and they told all the people, saying, There is the king sitting in the gate. So all the people came before the king, for every one of Israel had fled to his tent. David's mourning, it stole everybody's sense of victory. They felt like losers. They didn't feel like winners. And so Joab, he kind of snapped at David. Did you, did you catch that attitude that he had? He said, you get out there and you show some appreciation for these people. But do y'all remember how quiet Joab was at Abner's funeral? But here in chapter 19, Joab snapped at David. It almost like he felt like he had the right to do it, to snap at him. In fact, he's going to try to push David around. Push David around to the point where eventually later he's going to try to steal the throne away from David by trying to install Adonijah as king instead of Solomon. But by that time, when all this goes down, David will have been so fed up with Joab that he will have Joab executed in the book of 1 Kings. Now, it's amazing how Joab demanded, David, you need to get out there and speak to the people that saved your throne. But Joab himself is going to try to steal the throne 
later. Isn't there something wrong in this? I see it. 2 Samuel 19 and 9. Now all the people were in a dispute throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us from the hand of our enemies. He delivered us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, whom we anointed over us, has died in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? The survivors of Absalom's defeated army, the guys that said, we put Absalom over us. Well, now Absalom's dead. He's gone. They're starting to make their way back to Israel. And so they bumped into other Israelites on the way back, but it got them into an argument. They got in an argument with David's guys, kind of like Republicans and Democrats. You know, it's, let's say you just had an election. One guy lost, one guy won, but they all bump into each other. You know there's going to be a fight, okay? Adonijah lost. He's dead. He's gone. And so they bumped into the David's guys, and now they're all fighting about it. But the people who supported David were asking why the leadership in Jerusalem was not making any effort to bring the king back to Jerusalem. How come they're not trying to help get our king back? All these people were going to meet David at the Jordan River to welcome him back, and they're wondering, where's the leadership effort to bring David back? That's why they asked the question here, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? My guess is that the elders the, in Jerusalem, they were too afraid of making the other side mad by saying that they supported the king. It's like a politician, typical politician reaction. If I say this, then I'm going to make all these other people mad. But if I say that, then the other side's going to get mad. So they weren't saying anything. But people are asking, how come you're not making any effort to bring the king back? So when David heard about this, he decided to act. 2 Samuel 19.11 so King David sent to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house, since the words of all Israel have come to the king to his very house? You are my brethren, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? So he's asking the same question, how come you're not doing anything? We need to recognize that David did not ask them. If he could return, he didn't say, hey, guys, can I come back now? He's coming back. And he's like, why are you the last to ask me back? You do realize I'm coming, don't you? You do realize I'm coming back. How come you're not doing anything to facilitate my return? He says, I'm coming back. You should be looking for my return. Why are you the last ones to bring back the king? He basically saying, if anything, you're supposed to be the first. You should be looking for me to come back. Wow. Now, David could have just marched back in and sat on the throne, but since the people were divided in half, he wanted the priest, the leadership, the elders to get on board with his return. Back me up. Legitimize my return in front of everybody. You need to say the king's coming back, and you need to say it publicly. You need to profess the return of the king. Christian, are you hearing me? You need to profess out loud. Don't be afraid, oh, it's going to hurt this group and hurt that group. He says, look, you should be saying something. Why are you the last ones? You should be calling for my return to come back. But they were quiet. They were quiet. And the king, King David, he had a problem with this. Uh-oh. Oh, no, we can't speak out. It might upset somebody. It might offend somebody. Does that sound familiar today? So David called them out on their silence. You should not be quiet. You need to be saying something. You need to tell people the king is coming back. <laughs> you see the Jesus parallel in this, I'm sure, I hope. 2 Samuel 19, 13. And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also if you are not commander of the army before me continually in place of Joab. Whoa, 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 stop. I, 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 that one bit me. Okay, did y'all see that? Joab just got fired. He just lost his job. Joab's out of there. I told you Joab was starting to get on David's nerves here. Yes, Maybe David did need to get up and go rally the people up, but it was the way Joab snapped at David, that condescending, disrespectful tone with no reverence to it. That, 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 that's baloney. That's not how you talk to a king. David wants to eliminate all the division, 
and the troublemakers. He wants to get them out. Let's cause, let's put the trouble down. And so step one on David's list was for all the elders to back the return of the king. Okay, we just read that. But step two is remove the opposition. You got to get the, uh, the opponents out of the way, the guys that stand in the way of the king returning. And so to build up his support, particularly from his own tribe of Judah, David ordered the priests to tell his nephew, Amasa, that he would take over as commander of the army from Joab. Oh, things are really getting deep now, aren't they? Now, this is not not just playing family favorites here because Joab, uh, Amasa was the nephew, but Joab is too. Joab was also a, a nephew of David through a half-sister, if you look at First Chronicles 2 and 16. So they're both family, both Joab and Amasa. But Joab had become completely discredited in David's eyes. Da- David's like, I- I- I'm done with you, the way you're acting. Because Joab often, he publicly disagreed with David's policies. David was fed up with it, and so heads are starting to roll. Some people had to get fired. When people are insubordinate, they've got to be let go. Why? Because they inflame division. And so Joab's termination was a timely and it was a necessary action for the benefit of the people because David's trying to restore people together. There's a division. Some of the people that were under Absalom are upset. We lost Absalom and some people were upset. Well, how come we haven't been asking David to come back? Everybody's got this big argument going. David needs to get everybody together. And the pot stirrers have got to go. You got to get rid of those people. So did David's actions work, what he wanted to do here? 2 Samuel 19, 14. So he swayed the hearts of all the men of Judah, just as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word to the king, return you and all your servants. Then the king returned and came to the Jordan. And Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to escort the king across the Jordan. And Shemai, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, who was born from Behirim, hurried and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And they went over the Jordan before the king. Then a ferry boat went across to carry over the king's household and to do what he thought good. Look, David's mission was successful. Everybody's helping him to come back. You know, they're welcoming him. They're helping with transportation. They're supporting it. God works to uphold his covenant promise to David, doesn't he? He's working to keep that promise going. The king has returned and is being welcomed back by his own people, Judah, the people of Judah. But not only are his own people welcoming him back, but also a certain Benjamite. Did you see that? The Benjamite. You remember this guy, Shimei? And I hope I'm saying his name right to my Hebrew friends. If not, I'm a redneck Texan, and I just don't have that tongue, and I'm sorry, but I'll just keep rolling. (laughs) This is the guy, Shimei. That's the same exact guy that cursed David in chapter 16. Let me remind you of that. 2 Samuel 16, 5. Now, when King David came to Bahirim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei the son of Gera, coming from there. He came out cursing continuously as he came. So, guys, you remember Shimei, he yelled at David. He said, the Lord has given the kingdom to Absalom. It's not your kingdom. He gave it to Absalom. You bloodthirsty, cotton your own evil man. You know, he was just cussing him down. But then Shimei, apparently now here in chapter 20, I'm sorry, chapter 19, he realized all of a sudden wait a minute, the king is coming back. Uh Uh-oh, he's coming back and he's coming back soon. And it put a great fear in him, a great fear that caused him to understand that I'd better get right with this king and get right fast. Oh, the king's about to take the throne of Jerusalem and anybody that is still an enemy to him is going to be in big, big trouble. 2 Samuel 19, 18. Now Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. Then he said to the king, Do not let my lord impute iniquity to me, or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned, therefore here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. Well, that sounded very convincing, didn't it? Okay. 
Shimei, Shimei, Shimei. Okay. So <laughs> I told you. My, <laughs> okay. Let's just go on. You, you know where I stand already, y'all. Okay. So Shimei apologized for his past behavior and he begged the king. He goes, please don't hold this against me. I remember I cussed you out. I remember I said it should go to your son. And all that. Don't hold it against me, please. Don't impute this iniquity to me. Don't pass that on to me, please. So this is a picture of somebody who is begging for forgiveness of their sins. Now, what do you think a covenant king is going to do when a sinner asks forgiveness? A covenant king is going to offer it to him. 2 Samuel 19, 21, But Abishai, the son of Zariah, answered and said, Shall not Shemai be put to death for this, because he has cursed the Lord's anointed? And David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeria, that you should be adversaries to me today? Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king swore to him. Friends, listen to this. Listen to this. The king was willing to put his sin away. The returning king said, I'll put his sin away in order to have peace with him. The king wanted peace with him. Friends, King Jesus is coming soon, and he wants peace with you. You need to realize he's coming back. He's not asking permission if he can come back. He's coming. You need to get right before your king. 2 Samuel 19 and 24. Now Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king, and he had not cared for his feet nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in peace. So it was when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for your servant said, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go to the king, because your servant is lame. And he has slandered your servant to my lord the king. But my lord the king is like the angel of God. Therefore do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king. Yet you set your servant among those who eat at your own table. Therefore what right have I to still cry out any more to the king? So the king said to him, Why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said you and, Z you and Ziba divide the land. Then Mephibosheth said to the king, Rather, let him take it all, inasmuch as my lord the king has come back in peace to his own house. <laughs> that is so exciting to read that. Let me, let me go through that real quick. There's something wonderful just happened here. A couple chapters back, I went over how Ziba had brought all that provision to David. Remember that? And he, he cooked up this story about how Mephibosheth had supposedly betrayed David and he was going to try to steal the throne for himself because uh, Mephibosheth is a Benjamite, the same as the line of Saul. So he's like, no, man, Mephibosheth turned on you. He's still back there in Jerusalem. He's going to try to take the throne away from you. And that's why David asked him just now, he goes, how come you didn't come with me? Because David is thinking, well, yeah, you betrayed me, right? But this is a story that Ziba cooked up. He made it up about Mephibosheth. He did that to make himself look good in front of the king. He wanted to get a reward out of him. Have you ever had people try to cut you down to make themselves look better? I mean, you know, my opinion on that is if you want to look better, then go out and be better. You don't need to cut somebody else down to make yourself look better. But that's what Ziba did. He just wanted something out of David. But that's why Mephibosheth said that Ziba slandered him about being a traitor. David asked him, why didn't you come out and support me? Because David was believing Ziba's lie, but Mephibosheth never did betray David, nor did he try to steal the throne for himself at all. I want you to take notice of what the text says about Mephibosheth's appearance. It says his mustache was long and it was untrimmed, and he had not washed his clothes from the day he, that David had left until he returned again. Mephibosheth hadn't been taking good care of himself. He was dirty. His, his beard, his whiskers were long. And what this does for us, guys, is it gives us a time stamp, a point of reference set in time. What this means is this proves that Mephibosheth had not betrayed David. He's got the dirty clothes. His feet were unkept. He probably had long nails. His, his mustache was trimmed. He hasn't been doing regular 
things that people normally do to, for, to keep up with themselves. He was so under distress for David's safety that he didn't even ta- spend time taking care of himself. And the length of his whiskers was proof that ever since David left, David, I have been concerned about you. See, he did not betray David. That was a lie. And so he had tried, if he had tried to steal the throne, he wouldn't look like this. If Mephibosheth had truly tried to steal the throne from David, he would have gotten very cleaned up, trying to prepare himself for royalty to look royal. Guys, Ziba lied about Mephibosheth. In fact, Ziba met David where? Where did he give David the provisions at? At the top of the mountain, way up at the top, past that mountaintop, to give David the provisions for his escape from Absalom. And I figure the reason he probably went all the way up there was because Ziba knew that Mephibosheth was disabled. He couldn't walk very well. Remember, he said, your servant is lame. That means he couldn't walk too well. And so he went all the way up there on top of the mountain to give David provision to make himself look good. But he knows Mephibosheth wouldn't be able to get up at the top of that mountain to stop him in his lie. That's just terrible, isn't it? Ziba took advantage of Mephibosheth's disability and lied to David to try to gain a reward for himself. Oh, that's terrible. But I want you to look what Mephibosheth just said here now in chapter 19. He said, because David said, look, I gave everything to, to Ziba because I believed him. Now, why don't you two split it? And that would put Ziba in quite a position, wouldn't it? I bet David's thinking, yeah, now Ziba has to answer to Mephibosheth. No, David told us to split the land. But look what Mephibosheth said. He said, let Ziba take all of it. Let him have it all. Let him have everything he wants. All I care about is that my king is back again. Oh my gosh, that is good. Mephibosheth didn't want worldly treasures. He didn't care about anything down here. All he cared about was, my king is back. That's all I care about. Let him take it all. Take it all. Have everything. My king is back. That's all I care about. Oh, Mephibosheth, I just love you, man. I can't wait to see Mephibosheth in heaven. We're going we're gonna to sit down and we're going to have a nice talk. I say, dude, you really inspired me. Thank you for that. <laughs> Second Samuel 19, 31. And Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rojalim and went, and went across the Jordan with the king to escort him across the Jordan. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. And he had provided the king with supplies while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very rich man. And the king said to Barzillai, come across with me and I will provide for you while you are with me in Jerusalem. But Barzillai said to the king, how long have I to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am today 80 years old. Can I discern between the good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any longer the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be a further burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way across the Jordan with the king. And why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and mother. But here is your servant Chimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king and do for him. What seems good to you? And the king answered, Chimham shall cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. Now, whatever you request of me, I will do for you. Then all the people went over the Jordan, and when the king had crossed over, the king kissed Barzillai and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. Okay, guys, while David was away, when he was gone to escape from Absalom, Barzillai the Gileadite gave to the king straight out of his own pocket. He gave to the king. He didn't say, no, 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 this is my money. I'm keeping it because I need it for me. He realized my king needs this. I'm going to give it. So here we have two men, Mephibosheth and Barzillai. Now, Barzillai had a lot of money. He's very wealthy. Mephibosheth was like, hey, take it all. I don't need it. I'm just glad my king's back. So you got these two guys from completely opposite ends of the spectrum. These were both men who did not position themselves for gain from the king. They didn't look at the king and go, hmm, what can I get out of him? They were more interested in what they could give to him. 
They had no intention of self-gain, but to give of themselves for the king. Christian, listen to me. Your king does not exist to serve you. You are here to serve him, okay? And so now that David had come back, Barzillai presented himself to the king as a loyal subject because he was glad to see his king back again. And look at how David offered Barzillai a full retirement package. (laughs) He goes, come on with me. I'll take care of you, whatever you need. Come on back to Jerusalem. But Barzillai was not able to accept it, so he did pass it on to Chimham, who was possibly Barzillai's son. 2 Samuel 19 and 40. Now the king went on to Gilgal, and Chimham went on with him. And all the people of Judah escorted the king, and also half the people of Israel. Just then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brethren, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king, his household, and all David's men with him across the Jordan? So all the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative of ours. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we ever eaten at the king's expense, or has he given us any gift? And the men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten shares in the king. Therefore, we also have more right to David than you. Why then do you despise us? Were we not the first to advise bringing back our king? Yet the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. Okay, everybody's in a big fight. We have more right to the king than you do. We should get more than you. We're better than you. We're more invested than you. We're closer related than you. We this, we that. We're better than you. You're less than us. That's just the same old argument that goes on today. I'm better than you are. You're less than me. I'm more entitled. Give to me and not to you. You ever heard that? Come on, turn on the TV for two minutes, two seconds, and you'll see that. Guys, this just, no matter what era of history you live in, there's always going to be political divisions. You know, just a big fight over who's better. I'm better than you just so they could try to use the king to get what they wanted for themselves. And that's what drives the whole argument. But this is basically, guys, this is just selfishness. They're looking at the king to see what they could get out of him for themselves. Selfishness. The bigger problem here is that the very nature of their argument, okay, Maybe you are more invested. Maybe you are more closely related. Maybe you have this and maybe you have that. But the very nature of the argument is that it showed division. That's the bigger problem here. Forget the the details of who has what and all this other nonsense. The problem is you're fighting. That's the problem. That needs to stop. This is where the entire kingdom started to divide apart. And what we're going to end up with in the history future ahead is one kingdom in the north of Israel and another kingdom in the south where Jerusalem is, which would be the kingdom of Judah. And that's what political division does, guys. This selfish my way first is our party is better than your party. My way's better than your way. I'm better than you, so I should get more. And it cuts a nation right straight in half. America, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. The rest of the world as well. I'm an American. I know what's going on in this country, and this is exactly what's driving it. Give to me first. Give to me. I'm better. I'm right. You're wrong. I'm better than you. And they will even go so far as to use their king to, I'll pray for you in Jesus' name, to get their way. Guys, this at its core is sinful, dead wrong. It's divisive. It cuts a country in half, and it did it to Israel. Now, why can't we look back all these thousands of years later and realize, hey, we're going to repeat the same thing. Let's get back in in unity under the Lord. Stop looking at the king as who you can get something out of, but rather, what can I give? I think JFK said it well. Ask not what your country can do for you. What can you do for your country? Same thing. What can you do for your Lord? Not just what do I get out of him? But there's nothing new under the sun, is there? Now, for a minute, I want to focus on Shimei, and I want to use him as an illustration. He once cursed the king. He threw rocks at him and kicked up dust. Oh, you bloodthirsty evil man. God has given it to your son, Absalom. 
But once he realized that the king was coming back, uh uh-oh, the king's coming back, it scared him. It scared him. It put fear in him. So when David returned, Shimei fell before David and begged forgiveness, and David actually granted it to him. He gave him forgiveness. Did you see that? Oh my gosh, guys, this is what's great about a covenant king. He offers forgiveness. He gave it to him, and he refused to have Shimei executed. He could have. He had a guy ready to do it. Let's kill him. He refused to have him executed. He says, you'll live. Now, this is the point where you would expect me to make this great gospel parallel, and it does, just if you keep it there, it it does. That That part in itself makes a good gospel parallel picture about how Jesus forgives sinners. But Shimei's story actually goes farther than that. It goes further down the line. If you read ahead into 2 Kings, Shimei actually persisted in his rebellion against David. He sounded convincing. Oh, my Lord, I'm here. I'm the first here. I want to welcome home, King. Looked right, didn't it? Sounded good. But what this means here, though, is that Shimei was not being honest when he asked David for forgiveness. He asked, and it was very convincing, and all the words were right. It sounded good, but he wasn't really meaning it. Because later, he just keeps on in his uh, rebellion against David. It was a false profession just to try to trick the king into sparing him. That's all it was. King's coming back. Oh, I'm in trouble. Well, I better go act like I'm on his side. And he got down. Oh, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And the king says, okay. He actually offered it. Okay. David actually offered him to be spared. But Shemai's unrepentant heart proved his true character. It caused him to continually rebel against David until David told Solomon in the future, he was on his deathbed, he told Solomon, and he said, and remember, you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahirim, who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanaim. When he come down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him, bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Wow. Whoa. I wanted to see Shimei do well. I wanted to see him really get, get spared here, but it just wasn't in his heart. He just was not real. He wasn't being authentic. He wasn't being honest. So Shimei, he pretended to be loyal, but in his heart, he was not loyal at all. He was just saying the words, oh, here's what you should say, so I'll just say it, you know. and. For his continual rebellion, Shimei was eventually condemned by the king because the king saw what he did. The king knew better. And to think that Shimei could have been forgiven, that's what gets me. He could have been spared. He could have been saved. He had it. It was offered. But he thought he could fool the king into sparing him. And he even called him Lord. He called him Lord. Did you see that? My Lord, the king. Oh, he called him all the right words. Oh, I'm good. No. His, his character proved who he really was. His continual rebellion led him straight to his own condemnation. I want to show you. Now, do not miss this part. I held you up to now. I need you to listen. Turn off the distractions. Listen to me here real closely. This ought to scare you. It should. Matthew seven twenty one. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, you see that? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Friends, if that verse don't scare you, there's something wrong with you. It should scare you. This verse literally scared me into getting saved for real, to stop pretending, to stop with the false conversion nonsense, saying the right words. Okay, this is what everybody wants me to say. Ray, say this. Okay, I will. And there I said it. Okay, I look like a believer. Great. And I I wasn't because I hadn't changed. I was still doing the same old nonsense all the time. It was was just saying the words. Let me just say what my king wants to hear so I can get what I want out of him. That's the problem. Friends, King Jesus is coming back. And those who are truly loyal to the king, for real, for real, they really want to see their king come back. They don't care 
about the self-gain of worldly treasures and the money and all the stuff. They just don't care. Just like Mephibosheth, their attitude, our attitude as a believer, my attitude is rather let them have it all. I don't need it. Oh, all this money, all this stuff. I, I, I don't need it. I don't care. Let everybody else have it. I don't care. All we believers want is to see our king return. That's all we want. I don't want to get rich. I probably won't. I'm not looking forward to it. Not trying to do it. I don't care about money. I don't care about cars and boats and all these things. You people that want it, you go get it. That, that's, that's for you. I'm not going to do it. For the believer of Messiah Jesus, the real one, the believer that looks at his king, his covenant king, and says, Lord, forgive me, and never looks at him just for what I can get out of him, let him take it all. That's what we say. Just y'all can have it all. All I care about is that my king comes back again. Titus 2 and 13, the believer looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, that's what we're looking for. Oh, if you're, if you're wasting your life trying to get that big dollar bill in the sky, and if Jesus never really crosses your mind, well, you know, he's back there in the back of my mind somewhere. That's a guy, let me tell you, there's something not right. If, if every time you think of Jesus is, oh, Lord Jesus, give me this, and oh, Lord Jesus, give me that, but you're out there putting other people down, trying to push other people under the bus to better yourself, you're no different than the guy that, put, that lied about uh, Mephibosheth. You're no different. You see the see what's going on here. All the all the pieces moving in this story right now. While Jesus is away with the Father in heaven, the lawless are not giving of themselves to Jesus. They're not giving of their own pocket like Barzillai did for David. You know we're commanded to give, right? When you go to church, I hope you give because if you're not, you're breaking a commandment of God. Well, the church doesn't need my money. No, they don't. The problem is you need your money. Giving money at a church is an act of worship. It demonstrates, look, I don't depend on this. The Lord told me to give it, so I'm giving it. And yes, the church does use it. But it, for you, it is your act of worship. Are you not giving? Do you go to church and not give? You don't tithe? Well, I can't afford it, this, that, and the other. But you're there for what Jesus can give you? You're backwards, man. You need to turn back around the other way. The people who are looking for their Messiah, that's all we care about. We're like Barzillai. We give of ourselves to welcome the return. What we're doing is we're preparing for the return of the king. Unbelievers are too preoccupied with argument. I'm better than you. My group is better than your group. We're more entitled than you are. We're right. You're wrong. And I'll pray for you, those of you who are so wrong, until you're smart and right like I am. <laughs> They're preoccupied with we're better. We should be first. We should have more. And their fierce hostility is dividing the nation apart. It divides groups apart. It divides friendships apart. It's division. It's divisive. They are not doing the will of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, not the division makers, okay? But when the day comes that they finally find themselves standing before the King of King Jesus, they are going to try to fool Jesus with a false profession, just to manipulate Jesus. They're going to try to trick him into saving them after they had their entire lives to serve him, but they wouldn't do it. Like Shimei, their selfishness will only prove that they bowed to Jesus just to see what they could get out of him. Now, friend, right now you have the chance today from here on out. That's why I'm here telling you this. You've got the opportunity to be like Barzillai and use your possessions, use what you have, what the Lord gave you, it's really his in the first place, from your own pocket to serve King Jesus before he comes back. Before he comes back. Barzillai supported the kings while he was gone, the whole time he was gone. Then when the king came back, he goes, Barzillai, you can come with me. Friend, if you're not supporting the king while he's gone, you're going to be in trouble when he gets back. King Jesus, before he comes back, you can serve him in order to prove your loyalty as authentic, not fake. Mephibosheth had the long whiskers and unkept. He's demonstrated proof. I have been looking for my king. 
Barzillai gave while the king was away, while he was away, all this before the king came back. I want to encourage you to be like Barzillai by remembering what King David said to him in verse 38. He said, come over with me, cross over with me and stay with me and I will provide for you. King David said, I will provide for you. Friend, are you concerned about how you're going to be provided for? How am I going to make that rent check? How am I going to get by this? Oh, I don't have enough money to get out of these things. How are I going to get by? How am I going to get by? I want to show you Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I want you to notice this does not say, and my God shall supply most of your needs according to your own riches. It doesn't say that. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Friends, Barzillai gave, and so David offered to provide for him. So, how can we give to the Lord? That's a question. I want to get on board like Barzillai did. How do I do this? Okay, in your giftings in our talents, your time, and of yourselves, and yes, even in your finances. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, there's other ways to give. You can keep all your money. You don't have to give it. You can do it in other ways. Don't fall for that. We're commanded to. That's what Barzillai did. And look what the king told him. You can come over with me. I'll provide for you. Isn't that good? But those who engage in the kind of trouble of division, those are the ones who pretend to be Jesus' friend. They say they are, but their lives prove that they're not. Believers should never, ever engage in all the political, the fighting, the I'm better than you, I should come first. All that divisiveness and selfish manipulation, you should not be doing that. If you're a true, honest believer, what you need to be doing is nothing else but looking for the king to come back. Friends, the king is coming back the return of King Jesus. I want us to recall from chapter 15, back when David went out from Jerusalem, he sent the priests Zadok and Abiathar in to Jerusalem to be his representatives so that when he would return later, they could help his return. So remember that when David was about to return again, the elders were not making any effort to welcome him back. How come you're not asking me to come back? So David commanded his priests to speak up. He told him, you need to say something on my behalf because I'm coming. I'm coming back. You better start talking. He asked him, why do you say nothing about bringing back the king? Why are you the last ones to say anything? He wanted the priest to influence others to receive him before he got there. Friends, King Jesus is going to come back very, very soon. Very soon. And so he has sent us believers, his priests, into the world to be his royal representatives, and he expects us to speak up on his behalf. We have to be telling people the king is coming, and I want him to come back. I look for him to come back. We need to encourage others to receive him as king before he arrives. Don't say, well, I'll, get, I'll bow down and when, when he gets back like Shemai did. No, no, no. You need to be working now. Mephibosheth proved the whole time David was gone. It says from the time David left till the day he got back, Mephibosheth had proof upon him that proved he was a genuine believer that his king was coming back and he looked for him to come back. Barzillai gave of himself of, for the king while he was gone. And friends, that is our king's commandment. We have to be helping others to receive the king, encourage them to receive him as king before he gets back. It is commanded. And you know, David didn't ask the elders permission if he can come back. He said, I'm coming. I'm coming back. (laughs) Friends, we need to be proclaiming the king is coming. The king is coming. And with that, we need to prove our loyalty by being givers to the king, just like Barzillai did. Barzillai loved King David, and so he gave of his wealth to prepare for the turn of the king. Friend, let me ask you, do you love Jesus? Well, of course I love Jesus. I said the prayer 50 years ago. Are you proving it? Well, how do I prove it? You give of yourself. 
you prove your loyalty by giving to your king. That's how you do it. Well, you might be thinking, but I'm not rich. I'm not rich. I don't have anything. Actually, you are. You are very rich. You are rich. You are exceedingly rich with a spiritual currency, with spiritual money called faith. Spiritual currency called faith. We are supposed to get out there and spend it. Spend it on everybody you know. Spend it on every decision. Spend your faith. Spend that spiritual currency in everything you do to prepare for the return of King Jesus. Amen? There's two good things that came from Barzillai's faithfulness. David told him, whatever you ask me, come on with me, man. Whatever you ask me, I will do it for you. Did you catch that? That was good. Whatever you ask, I'll do it. Jesus said in John 14, 13, he says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It does not say whatever you ask in your own name, in your own selfishness, in your own agenda, in your own angle. He says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That's to glorify the Father. I want to be like Barzillai, don't you? I want to give of everything I've got to my king. I want to be a giver to my king while he's away because Barzillai was greatly rewarded when the king came back. Revelation 22 and 12, and behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. (laughs) Friends, the king is coming back. King Jesus is coming back, and he commands us to speak on his behalf. He commands us to do it, to encourage others, to help others start looking for the return of Messiah Jesus. Isn't that good? Don't get caught up in the divisive arguments of our day today that says, well, I want this, and I want that, and I should have this, and I'm better than you. Don't don't get caught up in that. That's foolish. Foolish and divisive arguments. Don't let that have you. Don't let self gain. Don't let money. Don't let that drive your ambition. Don't let it drive your vision, your momentum. Our desire should be like what Mephibosheth said. Rather, let them take it all. Let them have it. Let them have all of it. Inasmuch as my Lord the King has come back in peace, the King is coming back. Amen. Let me proclaim the name of Jesus as a representative of him here on this earth. Listen to me here, guys. This is very important. This is where I get to actually put into practice what I just said. So I'm actually getting to do what I just said. You know, I have people say, oh, good pastors are all hypocrites. No, we're only hypocrites if we don't do what we say. So I'm about to do what we just said here. King Jesus is coming back. And you need to be ready for him. He's coming back. He's not going to take votes. He's not going to see if the majority approve. He's coming back. And when he gets back, it's going to be on, man. And you don't want to wait till he gets here to go fall down in front of him. What you can do is fall down in front of him now. Get down before your king and say this prayer with me. Father, I have sinned. I, I messed up. Please do not impute this iniquity upon me. Rather, Lord, I am here before you. My king, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying for me. And that harsh penalty, you paid the penalty I was supposed to take. Forgive me and save me. And thank you, Lord, that you are a covenant king who loves to forgive because you desire peace and relationship with your people. I want that too, Lord God. Father, forgive me of my sins and save me. And I want to do for you everything you would have commanded me to do. Thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. There, I just proclaimed the return of the king. I spoke up on his behalf. Now you go do the same. Thank you so much. The king is coming. The king is coming. If you haven't got it yet, understand, the king is coming. You are not worthless. You are priceless. Messiah Jesus died on the cross to redeem you. You'll be set for me.